All right, first, second, third John, this is the class. Uh, lesson number four, Abiding in the Faith, is the title of the class, first John chapter four, verse uh, one, to chapter five, verse 21. Uh, in our last lesson, John highlighted the main differences between the good and the evil and uh, a surefire test to determine the two. He said, uh, the good obeyed Jesus and the evil disobeyed Jesus. Pretty simple, pretty simple acid test that he puts forth for his readers. Uh, he demonstrated this difference by showing that those who love Christ and their brethren were truly sons of God and those who didn't did not belong to God regardless of who they were or what other characteristics they had. They could be good people, smart people, uh, modern people, they could be all kinds of people, uh, but if they didn't uh, obey Christ, uh, they didn't belong to Christ. So John was doing this, of course, to reveal the hypocrisy of the false teachers who were infiltrating the church with their persuasive but false notions about true spirituality. That was the uh, battleground. What is truly spiritual? How are you truly saved? Who are truly the right ones? So in effect, he says to his readers, if you want to discern the truly spiritual people in the church, examine their behavior. Makes sense, doesn't it? Pretty common sense thing. Examine their behavior. If their behavior conforms to the example of Christ and His teachings, and especially His loving attitude, well then you have truly a spiritual person. Now if you remember in our previous lessons when he talks about these individuals, they're claiming to have a kind of a higher spirituality, a better spirituality. We'll show you a better way, they said. Uh, you know, a, a more intense, a more a godly gospel that'll give you even more spiritual insight and power. And this is why John is kind of answering this. You want to see who's spiritual? You want to discern who the truly spiritual are? Compare them to Christ. If they're doing what Christ does, if they're acting like He does, if they teach what He taught, then you've got a, a truly spiritual person uh, on your hands. If on the other hand, the person violates Christ's teaching or does not have love, especially, he says, for the brethren, that person's a fake, a son of the devil, he says, not a son of God. Love, according to John, is the defining characteristic of a Christian. Now in the final verses of chapter three, he summarizes the Christian's basic doctrines. Faith in Christ as Savior, that's one basic doctrine. Love of others as an expression of that faith. Kind of boils it all down to its most simplest parts. So in the final chapters, John will give the third of three. He started with good conduct, love, the third of three ways that a person can be certain that they belong to God. He will then finish with a conclusion and a, a summary. Remember, again, the argument here, the thing going on, who are the true disciples? Who are the ones that truly belong to God? The false teachers, the Gnostic teachers, the one who were teaching the secret knowledge, they said, you know, if you learn the secret knowledge from us and if you do what we say, you'll really be a spiritual person. You'll really be saved. And so John in his letter is saying to them, these are the marks of the person who's saved. You know, the one who believes in Christ and his teachings, the one who loves his brother, those are marks. Okay? Those are you know, uh, descriptive qualities of the individual who's saved. So let's look at our outline again, see where we are in the process. Confidence in salvation, right? That's what he's talking about. First lesson, we talked about confidence in salvation because we're walking in the light and all of what that means. Confidence in salvation by abiding in love. We talked about that. And in this, uh, particular section, John's going to talk about confidence in salvation because we abide in the faith. So we've seen the way that John describes the fully human, fully divine Jesus from his eyewitness experience. He's also given two ways to confirm to yourself your salvation. If you walk in the light, 
If you abide in love, you know you are saved because that's how saved people act. He also, as I've just mentioned, gives some ways to discern the true from the false disciples and teachers. For example, disobedience to Christ, especially in the matter of loving one's enemies. Now he gets back on track for the third way a person can be assured of their salvation, whether or not they respect and teach and live according to Jesus' word. That's the third way he provides. So let's start chapter four, shall we? He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Uh, in this section, when he talks about spirit, He's talking about teachers. He's not talking about ghosts or apparitions. He's talking about teachers. We know that in context because then he talks about prophets and teachers. So spirits are teachers. Okay? Um, and he deals with the false teachers head on, calls them out. A simple acid test. True teachers teach that Jesus is fully human and fully divine at the same time. That's the true teaching about Jesus Christ. False teachers vary from this teaching. Either Jesus is not fully human, he's really a spirit, only appeared as a human, or Jesus is really only human, and for a time the Spirit of God was on him, you know, like the prophets of old, to do great things. Those are false teachings. Jesus fully human, fully divine, at the same time, from birth to physical death, and of course, subsequent resurrection. So anyone claiming spirituality, John is saying here, anyone claiming spirituality or knowledge or insight teaches this teaching. And those who do not, do not come from God, regardless of their personal, uh, personality or their following. They may be sincere, but they're in error. I mean, this passage here is a hard teaching when you think about the, you know, the consequences of it. Whoever does not teach that Jesus is fully human and fully divine does not have God. There are a lot of people <laughs> who teach that Jesus is not divine or not human or not the Savior. And John is saying here, these people do not have God. That's a hard teaching. Because most of the quote teaching from higher institutions today are pluralistic in nature. In other words, trying to get as many people as possible into the kingdom of God. I've heard one teaching, interesting, interesting teaching for what it is, but the idea being that every single religion is really a Christian religion, but stunted. In other words, the Hindu religion is really a Christianity, and if Hindu kind of, if they could have just followed through on their thinking, they'd arrive at the point where Jesus is God. And so would Muslims, and so would Buddhists, and so would every other religion. A very deep book, high sounding theological themes and ideas, but not in concert and not according to what John says here in just a few verses. So John, you know, uh, anyone claiming rather spirituality or knowledge needs to be teaching this simple thing. Let's keep reading what he says. He says, they are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. 
he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So he, doubled down, he doubles down here. You know, he says it one time, then he says it another time. Those who are not teaching this, they're in error. He goes on, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we, do, uh, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So John repeats the idea that love is also a factor in determining the true disciple and teacher. However, he also adds that God's love was the motivating factor in sending Jesus, and to deny this is also to deny God's love. Why else would God send Jesus? Why else, why else this plan that took several thousand years to be fulfilled you know, to save us? Why else do that? So to neglect or to change this teaching is also to neglect to teach the single most important example of God's love for man. Because if, if Jesus isn't God, then God is not displaying His love to man. Because it's God in the form of man that came to earth and that suffered the cross. So if Jesus is only a man, then you know, that takes God out of the equation. If Jesus is only a spirit, then it takes the sacrifice out of the equation. He has to be divine and human. Divine to give the sacrifice power and value. Human in order to be able to relate it to human beings. You take away one side or the other, you, you, you spoil everything. Without Christ, and proper teaching about Him, we cannot attain the kind of love that sent Him and the kind of love that comes from Him. So false teaching therefore interferes with the love of Christ for us. This is truly what they are to lose if they follow the false teachers. He's talking to them about love. Keep reading. It says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and he, he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also, again, on the same theme of love, those who accept the proper teaching will also enjoy the fruit of that teaching in their lives, and that is the love of Christ in their hearts. If you, don't, if you reject the idea that Jesus is divine or that Jesus was fully human and offered His sacrifice for you, you don't receive the benefits of salvation. The benefit of salvation is that your sins are forgiven and that you receive the spirit that indwells you. And when you receive that, you're transformed, you're regenerated into a new person, a new person with the capacity to love as Christ loves. 
And he's saying if you, if you mess around with the doctrine, you're not going to get the result of the doctrine. If you change the teaching of the gospel, you won't receive the benefits of the gospel, which is the forgiveness of sins. I mean, what motivates Christians? Gratitude, I don't know about you, gratitude. I am so grateful that God forgave, forgives my sins. Yesterday's sins, today's sins, even tomorrow's sin, He'll forgive those. I'm grateful for that. I'm, and I'm, I'm convinced we all are. And this is what motivates us to do what we do as Christians, to go the second mile, to, to turn the other cheek, all those things that, that we see that God uh, you know, uh, gives us to do, gives us the example to do. We do these things because of gratitude, because we realize what we have because of the gospel. But if you take the gospel away and change it, you won't have those things. And that's what, that's what he's arguing here. And so the love that we have for God that continues to be developed and cultivated in us through the Spirit as we submit ourselves to the Spirit in our walk of faith, this love will bind us to God, he says. It'll bind us to our brethren and it'll fortify us against Satan's attack. Attacks meant to make us feel guilty and unsure about our salvation by accusing us of our sins and our failures. I've said this before, right? The accuser of the brethren, that's the devil, all day, all night, he accuses us. Just remember, you know, when, you're, when, when, you're, when your inner voice tells you that you're no good, or if your inner voice tells you that you're not going to make it, or that your sins are really not forgiven because you haven't repented enough, Ask yourself the question, is this Jesus talking to me? <laughs> is it the Lord that's saying to me, you're no good? Is it the Lord saying to me, you haven't repented enough? You haven't paid enough for your sins? Is that Jesus talking to you from the cross? <laughs> it's an old story, but it still works. And 2018, just like it worked back in the first century. Same old tactics. So John says we can, we can withstand these things and have confidence and peace of mind if the love of Christ and others is on our hearts. It's a simple equation. If as a Christian you're feeling guilty a lot, love more. Uh, that's, the, that's the antidote. <laughs> love more, love more God. Love God more. Love your brethren more. Unsaid but, intend, but inferred here is that this love is only available to those who accept the teachings about Christ as given by the apostles. All the teacher, excuse me, all the false teachers will produce, talking about these false teachers here you know, uh, in the first century, all that the false teachers will produce is doubt, fear, pride, sorrow. That's the only thing that they're producing in the church at this particular time. And John is saying to you, the gospel has brought the love of Christ into your very heart and soul something that these false teachers and their teachings cannot give you. And so we jump to chapter five, verse one, he says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So John continues to repeat and build on this idea of abiding in faith as a way to be certain of um, teachers and certain of self. He said that the teaching will produce the love of God in our hearts for others. He said that false teaching will not produce this kind of fruit. 
Now he's trying to demonstrate how love of God is manifested. He's already explained some ways that the love of the brethren is shown. Here he says that obedience to Jesus' word is the way that we show God we truly love Him. Doing this, he says, will produce three things. First, it'll show God that we love Him in the way He wants us to show that we love Him. If God did not demonstrate to us and give us instructions on how to worship Him, we would not know how to worship. I mean, just take a look in the world, all right? Take a look at countries, different countries, the, the religions that have grown up without the revelation of God, and look at what they do. They fall down in front of statues. Their concept of God is something that has six arms and 12 eyeballs. You know what I mean? This is without understanding and knowledge, so, so unless God opens the eyes of man, man doesn't know what to do in his relationship with God. We don't know how to worship him unless he's given us how to do it. Songs and spiritual songs and prayers in the name of Christ and the communion with the bread and the, the fruit of the vine and remember, you know, all of this, we didn't make this up. God gave this to us. We demonstrate our love to him by obeying the things that he's given us. Why? Because in doing it His way, we please Him. Isn't that what we want to do when we're worshiping? I want to please God, not myself. Secondly, we show that our faith and our love are sincere and real and, and, and effective. When I do you know, God's things, God's ways, I'm saying to God, I, I, want to, I want to please you, Lord. I want to show you my love. You know, my grandchildren, I show them my love, you know, as we all do, right? We hug them and we, give, we hug them and we just want to squeeze them, right? And give them a kiss or play with them or buy them things. That's, but we can't do that to God. We don't buy them anything. We can't hug them. We can't kiss them. But we can obey the things that He's given us to do. That shows our love to Him. And also it shows that the world no longer owns us. We are free from the world and the flesh and the law once and for all. We're able to say to Satan, you don't own me anymore. We're able to say to the world, you don't own me. I live here, but you no longer own me. Verse five to 12, I need to kind of move here. It says, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He has testified concerning His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. The one who does not believe God has made Him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning His Son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Can it be any clearer? Could John have stated this idea any, any more clearly? I'm not even sure that's good grammar. <laughs> I mean, John throws down one last challenge to the Gnostic teachers who uh, here, um, who, who are trying to lure away the innocent and unsuspecting with their promises of secret knowledge and spiritual power. He states once and for all that the only way to be free from the flesh, from the world, that's what the Gnostic teachers are promising, the only way to be free from this is to be free through Christ. They're teaching, you want to be free, well, you, know, you have to give up pork 
and you give up eating meat. And if you're married, you, know, you have to abstain from sex and you have to do this and you have to do that. You know? And then you'll, you'll, you know, you'll get to that secret power, that powerful spiritual place. And John is refuting this. The way to access the power of God is through the Son of God. And he reminds them of the life of Christ, the amazing witness of God. What, what, what do you think the water is here? When he's talking about the water, well the water, Jesus was baptized. What happened when Jesus was baptized? God from heaven confirmed that He was the Son of God. So there's the water, there's the voice, the Spirit. What do you think the blood is? Well the cross and the resurrection. He's saying these things witness who Jesus is the very Son of God. So the amazing witness of God at His baptism, there's the water, the glorious ministry of miracles through the Holy Spirit, the death and resurrection, there's the blood, the three witnesses. If you doubt, he says, look at the witness that testifies to the truth of what Jesus taught and compare that to what these false teachers are teaching. Because spirits don't bleed and hedonists don't do miracles. His ministry was no secret. Jesus' ministry, no secret. In essence, John is saying to his readers, if they don't believe these witnesses and the promise of eternal life these witnesses have made, then they forfeit the promise. Okay, you don't want to believe Jesus? You don't want to believe these three witnesses here? Not good enough for you? You want to go with the secret teachers? You want to go for the secret knowledge? Go ahead, he says. But realize one thing. You're, you're leaving behind the promise of eternal life that comes with Christ. If you think you've got a better deal somewhere else, yeah, go for it. And, no, and make no mistake, he says. The promise of eternal life only comes through Christ and His teachings, not through the secret and false teachings of these Gnostics. Don't just listen to him, he says. You know, don't just listen to me, you know, John, he says. Listen to the witnesses that witness to the truth of what I'm saying to you. So in the final verses, John will summarize and close his letter concerning this subject. So let's read on. Verse 13, he says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from Him. So he ends this much, he ends this much the way as he ends his gospel. You know, he could write much more, he could argue much more, but these three ways, you know, walking in the light, experiencing the love of God, remaining faithful to the teachings, these three ways will help you have confidence, he says. And how to discern the true from the false teachers, all of this should be enough to preserve and strengthen their faith. If we pray to God to help us to do these things, here, you know, this is not where he's saying, you know, if you want a new bicycle, you know, ask God and you'll get a new bicycle. In this particular passage, he's referring to what he's been talking about. If you're lacking confidence in your faith, he's saying, ask God, he'll give you that. If your faith about who Jesus is is a little shaky, you don't quite grasp everything, ask God. He'll give you, he'll help you, you know, grow stronger in your faith concerning Jesus. If you recognize that, yes, uh, you know, Christian love, the kind of love that God wants us to have uh, for self and for others, when we examine ourselves, we're thinking, well, I'm not as much of a loving person as I thought I was, or I could sure do a lot better, and I would like to be able to love more. Well, he's saying, ask God, He'll give you this. This is the kind of prayer that God answers. So if we pray to God to help us to do these things, He will answer our prayers. This is what this section is actually referring to. 
verse 16 and 17. He says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that Jesus talked about the sin that leads to death before in Mark 3, uh, 29, Luke 12, 10. You know, it says, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven of him. So this John is referring to these passages here in, that are in Mark and Luke. Now in context, Jesus in these passages was referring to those who were saying that he, Jesus, was of the devil and his teachings were false. And so John has been talking about people who claim Jesus is a ghost and his teachings are not inspired or they're incomplete. And I believe that John is echoing Jesus here saying that all manner of sin is forgivable except denying Christ, denying his word, denying his work. This is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because He is the one who brings Christ. It's the Spirit that brings Christ's word. It's the Spirit that brought Christ from, to the cross and resurrected Him from the dead. So if you deny this, I mean, there's nowhere else to go for forgiveness. That's the point. In other words, John is saying, if someone denies Christ and remains in denial of Christ, His person and His work and, so, and denies all of that, don't ask God to forgive him that. Why? Because that's the only way that that person can receive forgiveness, through Christ. So if they reject Christ and they, 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 they completely you know, do away with that, there is no other way for forgiveness. And John is saying, don't ask God to make an exception of someone who has denied Christ. He won't. This is the way of salvation. And this is quite an indictment against the false teachers. Let, let's always stay in context, okay, before we apply the ideas to the 21st century. He's still talking about the false teachers. No forgiveness for these guys. Don't ask God to forgive him because he was nice to you and you know, he bought lunch <laughs> while he was talking to you about his false doctrine. So John has been talking about people who claim that Jesus is a ghost and his teachings are not inspired. So if you deny this, there's nowhere else to go for forgiveness, as I said. John says you can pray that God forgive men's weaknesses and immoralities, their irreverence, their failures, but don't ask Him to forgive those who promote false teaching or rejection of Christ, again, because there's no other way to save these people. Now, I'll say this, because there's always a lot of discussion about you know, the, the unforgivable sin. If that person repents, if that false teacher says, you know, I've, I've, I've given it more thought and you know, I have to admit that, yes, I, you know, I was wrong about that. Jesus, He is the Son of God. Now that I look at the evidence and I've thought about it and so on and so forth, well, of course that person is saved, because why? They've repented of their false teaching and false things and they've come to believe in Christ. Well, of course God will forgive them. It's not the idea that God refuses to forgive somebody forever, never talk to me about it, doesn't matter if he repents, he's done. No, of course not. And so John finishes with four things that all Christians should know. Verse 18, he says, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. Christians are not slaves to sin. He's not saying here, no one who is born of God sins repeatedly as a habit. We all sin, of course, but we're not slaves of sin. The cross cleanses us. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be free from the slavery of habitual sin. Second thing, verse 19. He says, we know that we are of God. 
and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So Christians know that there are only two kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. You're in one or the other, there's no neutral place. The majority of the people in this world are in the kingdom of Satan, but don't realize it. That's why we preach the gospel, brethren. That's why we have missionaries. You know, we've got one in Africa, we've got one in Haiti, and then we've got one on the internet. You know, that's why we do that. Because people are lost without Christ. There's no other way to save them. And then verse 20, he says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Anybody says, you know, where does it say in the Bible that Jesus is God? Well, go to 1 John 5.20 and read that. What does it say? In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Christians know and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior. Those who are with Him are saved and those who are not are not. Again, a hard truth. But we did not proclaim this truth, God did. We simply repeat the truth. And then finally in verse 21 He says, little children, guard yourselves from idols, Worshiping any other God or form of God is wrong and not part of Christian teaching. So beware of those who try to make it so. Always keeping in mind he's talking about the false teachers at that place. So John ends with a warning to his flock and a warning to those who would seduce them after vain idols of human philosophy or speculation rather than the gospel message preached by the apostles. Nothing has changed to this day. We still have false gods and false teachings emanating from very smart and intellectual uh, people. That continues to be the case today. Many I mean, today it's, you're, you're considered sophisticated if you're an atheist. Yes, yeah, you're sophisticated if you're an atheist. If you're a Christian, well, you know. You're certainly not sophisticated. So nothing has changed, right? This, this, this was the argument 2,000 years ago. Come on, step up to a higher level, you know? I say to you, stick with the gospel. Same attack today. Evolution, humanism, aliens. <laughs> there are people who believe that aliens started the human race. All attempts to explain life and death without Christ are in the spirit of the Antichrist. A lot of people get their religious training from movies. You know, the Antichrist in the movie, all something with big eyes and horns and you know, his head twisting around and spitting up pea soup and all kinds of stuff. The Antichrist, you know. That's Hollywood's Antichrist. John is saying, who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is anyone who preaches that Christ is not the Son of God. Who is that person? He is the Antichrist. No big mystery. The Antichrist could be a blonde haired, blue eyed, 25 uh, year old woman. So we need to keep that in, we need to keep that in mind. The Antichrist is the one that preaches that Jesus is not God, that the gospel is not for salvation. That's the Antichrist. And he said, it's in the world, it's already there. Well, of course, it was already at the church. He was already fighting it. Okay, so that's the end of uh, First John. Not a very long reading assignment here, but if you want to just read ahead, Second John, be ready for that. We'll do that one next time. We'll go through, we'll do Third John. And bonus lesson in this series, We'll also do the letter to Philemon, another short epistle, because we've got one week left in the quarter, and we'll be able to do the letter to Philemon in one class at the very end of the quarter. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention.